Welcome back to the Changing Earth podcast with author Sarah F. Hathaway and co-host Chen Gibson. Blending survival fiction and fact to bring you entertaining education that will help you dream, survive, and thrive. And now, here's your host, Sarah F. Hathaway and Chen Gibson. Hello, and welcome back to the Changing Earth podcast. This is episode 395, and we are diehardin' it today, coming uh, live on Easter Sunday. Hey, Chen, what's up? Hey, chins up, y'all. And we roped Jasmine in as well. Um, uh, Jasmine, I don't want to slaughter your last name. So um, just uh, Jasmine's definitely a PBN diehard fan, uh, kindred spirit. And so I'm going to give you the mic and uh, just allow you to do a little intro for, for the audience there. Yeah, so um, my name is Jasmine Biondi. Uh, if you guys are in the chat, you'll see me as JB uh, Biondi in there um i am a garden enthusiast i love my garden and having multi-purpose plants and uh we have a homesteading group uh that we've kick-started last year and it's grown quite a bit and we're sharing knowledge so it's fantastic love that spreading the word getting people involved even though they might be uh under undercover sneak attack. yeah yeah sneak attack <laughs> that's how you that's how you gotta exactly. work on the west coast you know that's yes uh, the, <laughs> the, the the great pacific northwest <laughs> so uh jasmine's gonna be the new mastermind behind uh the final uh beautification i should say of the new audio drama so thank you jasmine yay it's so nice to have somebody who knows uh what they're doing and is not 100 percent self-taught on this stuff to bring us the finished format so thank you for all that you do that's that's fantastic i, I can't thank you enough yeah it's my pleasure it's it's been a lot of fun working on this project yeah, I believe one of your because you used to work for MTV. So one of the quotes that I heard was it's a be lot better than hearing stories about pregnant teenagers. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> um, I worked for a studio that did a lot of MTV work. They would bring it into our studio for audio sweetening and cleaning up the, po the production audio. And I lost quite a few brain cells, <laughs> wa like watching Sarah, these. You you have an audio sweetener now. On I staff. know, <laughs> right? Check me out. That's Come awesome. I'm stoked. It's all due to PBN community. What a fantastic community! I yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, can't tell you. Okay, big news is drum roll, please. Sarah has been working very, very hard, and Burgess, although not ready for sale yet, you still got to wait for the date on that. Sorry, Garden Girl. Um, not ready for sale yet, but we are going to start podcasting Burgess next week. So forget, what did I say? Episode 400, forget all about that. We are beginning. Just can't wait. Yes. We're beginning next week, uh, with the Burgess book. So yay. We'll be back to the survival fact and fiction format. So what I'm thinking, because I've never done them live before that way, um, so what I'm thinking is that I will play the chapter live. Show will start the same time. The chapters are usually like at the longest, maybe 10, min 10 minutes. So, I mean, it, it's not going to, um, you know, it'll just bring that enrichment to the show. And so we'll start the same time. We'll do the chapter of Virgis. We'll take the survival lesson out and then we'll do the change in earth news and uh, we'll do it all live. So we'll see how this is going to work out. I don't know. It's going to be a work in progress. You ready, Chin? Always. <laughs> and you never know who you're going to bump into along the street, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, no spoilers. Well, no Easter eggs. <laughs> audio drama listeners are gonna know a lot of the story a lot uh already but um, but it's so fun from all the different angles i yes. love this stuff yes and so total um insider tip the end of the Virgis novel is different than the end of his story in the audio drama 
So there's there's your like little Easter egg, and we won't be there for a while. Yeah, he <laughs> some up your Easter egg on Easter. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, I believe. Um, so when we hear it on my podcast, it's going to be my voice reading the book. But I believe that uh, Phil Rabelais, who plays Virgis in the audio drama, he's going to do the audio drama for. Uh, the audiobook itself. So if you purchase the audiobook, it'll be in his voice, which I've never had anybody else read my audiobooks. So that's gonna be fun. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it goes. He's busy right now. He's got the you know his podcast, matter of fact. And then he's doing Just the new. Up with, yeah. yeah, with Gillian. Um, mm-hmm. really cool show. What was it? raising values? Yeah. Hmm. And it goes, it's on on Sunday morning. So, you know, impeding on my day, kind of, I get it, but. <laughs> it's a busy day. The, the podcast is, I mean, the, the network is getting huge. Yes. It used to be, uh, what was it, uh, Double double Shot Tuesdays or whatever. Yep. Now it's almost every day we got multiple shows. Yeah. A lot of content to uh, mm-hmm. take in. So. It's awesome. It is. It's growing. We're in multiple countries across the world. We are, we are PBN. Love it. Okay, so today we're talking about flowers because it's Easter Sunday. Christ is risen. Praise the Lord. We're here doing the show, but we wanted to keep it positive. So that's why we got Jasmine with us today. She's kind of my ace in the hole as far as bringing us some interesting plants and things like that. Um, I'm a big believer in planning what you can eat in your garden. And so my mom's a big believer in planning color. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, why would you want to plant these flowers if you cannot eat them? Right? <laughs> I'd rather plant <laughs> dandelions or something like that. Right? But a lot of them are very beneficial. So Jasmine, um, if you were going to plant three, only three, we're going to start with three. We'll go on from there. But the, the top three, if you were going to plant in your yard, what would those three be? Oh, well, it's definitely going to be in the herbs family. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say chives and uh, lavender and oregano. Chives. Yes. Why? These absolutely love the flowers that chives produce they're oh. and they're really pretty they're like a little palm they're white. palm they're yeah they're white little pom poms and they'll they'll go over they're all over them and we we keep them like around the house and out by our tomato plants to kind of attract our pollinators to our garden uh because as we know bee populations are not as they used to be so right. um trying to bring those attractants to where you want them to be is is a big thing um and they're they're just they're they're also really pretty to look at they're very ornamental looking and i love them on my baked potatoes I mean, yeah that, that's what i yeah. was thinking right and you can eat them yeah and that's the beautiful thing it's dual purpose and then you can save the seeds for the next year and just keep the process going are they pretty good at planting themselves like my Absolutely. basil went wild out here it went just crazy basil everywhere um, I had like a basil garden <laughs> last year. It was just all basil. I was like, okay, this is a little out of control. So is chives going to be like the same way? Yeah. Uh, chives will also self seed. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're pretty, it, but it also really depends on your climate. If you have really harsh winters, there is a potential of them, not the seeds actually not being viable. Mm-hmm. Um, so usually what I do is I'll just like cut the flowers like right when they start to look like they're drying up and then I'll just hang them upside down in uh, uh, manila uh, envelope and then just kind of let them yeah. air dry. Save them for next year. Never a bad yeah. idea to learn how to collect seeds now. Yeah, it's and it's a lot friendlier on your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Truth. Okay, the lavender is pretty. And if it grew, right, you know that it, it, it was a productive mm-hmm. seed, right? Yes. Right. Yeah, that seed likes your climate if it grew and Yeah, seeding. exactly. Mm-hmm. You said it much better than trying to stumble through it. You know, that's, that's <laughs> what I do. My mouth runs a lot. 
Um, lavender, I get, I get that one. Uh, lavender is good medicinally too, right? Yes, it is good medicinally and also culinary. Um, it's a great, if you like floral, um, flavors, like, uh, you could do lavender sodas, you can make, um, lavender cupcakes and, and it, it's a very interesting flavor. It's also kind of has that calming effect as well. Oh, you know, you're what? eating it. I used to use it on, um, bug bites that y- yeah. use the essential oil on bug bites, the lavender oil, and it actually like calms them. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. that, that as well. There's, there's a lot of things that lavender has that is beneficial, <laughs> not, not just uh, bringing in the pollinators, but right. there's a lot of medicinal uses for it. Well, oregano, and it makes fanta- oregano spaghetti. So we get that one. You got tomatoes. You got to grow oregano. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so mine were um, borage because borage I plant by tomatoes and they, per- they help deter tomato worms. So tomato worm problems, borage goes with it. It's a pretty hardy little plant, and it's beautiful. Like, you have to trim it back or else it just goes crazy. It'll take over your tomatoes. Um, We do a lot of marigolds in the garden, even though you can't eat them, which sucks. But It's for the bugs. The bugs, right. But yeah. And they grow like crazy in Texas. Again, I could be like a marigold farmer here. Um. And then I did thyme because I like thyme and they have the little purple flowers on it and it's pretty. So I was like, okay, thyme. Thyme goes in there. So what about, do you got some flowers you like to plant, Chin? Are you, are you a flower guy? Uh, not so much. Roses because <laughs> they have thorns. I plant them underneath the, the windows. The windows. <laughs> yeah, as a deterrent. No doubt. We've always planted ro- roses underneath the windows on first floors. Mm-hmm. We have yuccas here. Um, so where my dogs are running obsessively, I want to plant yuccas there and be like, ha ha, try and run through that. So, <laughs> 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 and you can eat you can eat the yucca root. They actually sell it in the store down here. It's more more common in the south than it is the north. But what's yeah. it like? I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna find so, out, but I don't know yet. Trying- well, go ahead. It's actually it's actually pretty good. It it kind of has like the texture of like a potato when it's fried. Okay. So a lot of people will make uh like f- French fry styles and they'll fry it up. It's pretty good. Hmm. What about Jerusalem artichoke? Have you ever eaten that? I haven't, but it's something I'm adding into the garden this year. Okay. So <laughs> cool. I, I want to know how that goes. <laughs> Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it takes because it'll be pretty cool. I've heard that once it does take, it can go like bamboo. It can just be like crazy growth on it. Yes. Um, so I'll probably keep that in pots. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to plant it like at the back of my property, maybe like by where the chickens could kind of keep it under control. You know, they won't let anything get out of control. So yeah, they might not even let it grow. <laughs> <laughs> right well that's why i like put it on the edge of their fence line so it can't it's like yeah. be- between the property line and their coop and that way like just plant it in a row there and that way if it tried to like come it might go into my neighbor's yard and grow crazy in there <laughs> there they got a cow field over there so hopefully cows can eat it too i might have to do some more research on that first so yeah. I've, I've heard they taste fantastic, so I'm excited to plant that. I uh, did, you know, I've eaten cattails and stuff like that, and that's all good stuff. So, I mean, it can't be can't be too far off of that. Um, Edible landscapes. You a fan? I, I'm definitely a fan, um, just because a lot of people don't know it when they look at it. So, right. you're not going to really have, I mean, like one, one great plant um is uh let's see um, magnolia trees okay so a lot of people don't know this but the flower buds are actually edible and you can pickle them and it's like pickled ginger huh kind of like what you do with a uh, uh, sushi yeah and it's it's got a pretty pretty decent kick to it it's so it's like a floral but gingery flavor um 
Oh, a dear friend of mine just let me know about that recently. And I was like, oh, well, guess what? I have a lot of around. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so we're going to start it's foraging. Yeah. 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 So we're going to start uh, foraging magnolia buds as they're popping up because it's about that time because that's a pretty messy tree. So a lot of people take them out. <laughs> oh, and your area. When I, when, I moved to a, when I moved to South Carolina, I got my first dog and, and I didn't know. I was trying to find a southern name for it, so I named her Magnolia, <laughs> Maggie. <laughs> that is awesome. After the tree, because it's so, you know, it's such a southern plant, you know, tree. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Like, what's the growth range on that? Was it, like, um, throughout the U.S. or more to the south? But you're in the north, west, so. What... Yeah, so it usually, it's a pretty hardy plant, Um uh, it will grow with mild winters mm -hmm. and with some pr pretty harsh winters. It'll go into dormancy, so it it usually survives pretty, but it, not like an Alaska winter. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're up listening in Alaska, don't you? Can't yeah, it's a gorgeous it. flower. It's got the huge white leaf petal, whatever. And that yep. the petals is what you're actually like pickling. Yes, the actual flower <laughs> petals themselves. And I it's amazing. That's Let's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy cool. I didn't even think of that. Um where you're at, you get the fiddlehead ferns too. We don't get them yeah. down here as much. Yeah. Yes. Um another great uh another great like um oh, what is it? It's uh there's a lot of like like chamomile and calendula. Mm -hmm. Like those flowers are very ornamental looking. Um, um, so are yarrow. Pie, oh yeah, yarrow is a great oh, one. Oh, don't start her on yarrow. Holy smokes! Uh -huh, no, yarrow, yeah. <laughs> dude, that's a because that is sports injuries like yarrow. So I was like yarrow. Hmm? Uh -huh. Yeah, and they're they're pretty. They're they're really pretty to look at. They could be put into your landscaping. Um, it, same thing with like the lavender, mm -hmm. uh, echinacea, or your um, lemon balms or no, bee balms. I was just gonna say the lemon balms. Yeah, to, the where if you're in mosquito heavy areas, you better have the lemon balm going. Oh, and it's heavenly. Um, if you like ornamental grasses, uh, lemongrass. Yep, lemongrass mm -hmm. is amazing too. It also will. Uh, repel mosquitoes and except, you can eat it you can throw it in your food <laughs> except when my kids go through the garden they're like oh this is grass i'm like oh okay. <laughs> it'll be a little bit harder to cut that down <laughs> at least you're trying <laughs> so um what was the one, other one i was thinking about oh when you said the chamomile in California and like the riparian areas, I haven't seen it as much out here. So I'm talking like next to parking lots and stuff like that. Um, pineapple weed grows there and that's actually a wild chamomile. Um, and it's a little scrubby little plant, but it, it's pretty. So, and then it is a, a chamomile that you can use. So that's a good one. We have that for tea, right? Yeah. So see calming, calming yeah. tea. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. And on to, to go back, back, piggyback on that, uh, dandelions too. I yeah. mean, most people see them as weeds, but you can make a coffee out of their roots. Uh, there, you can use the leaves for salads and the flowers to make honey jelly. So it's it's pretty great, um, but you just got to make sure they don't get. I've heard the, the peed on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't want them. You, you have to don't wash them from the dog park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, don't exactly. or like the edge of the road. Don't use those ones. <laughs> don't do it. Um, yeah. They make uh, fritters out of the bl out of the flowers as well. I've heard those are pretty darn good. Dandelion I fritters. I have to try that. I know. That's one I've had on my list for a while. I like. I'm not a super bitter type food eater, so like, wow, it's so bitter. The, the leaves are so bitter, but that's for the salt salad kind of. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's really a power pack plant as far as nutrition goes. So, yeah. There's like that one stringy lettuce that you get in like a lettuce bag that's like super bitter. It's not, it could be arugula, but I don't think it is. It's like a spindly one and it is the worst. I just hate it. And the, it, dandelion kind of reminds me of that. So I'm like, eh. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's understandable. 
Another fantastic, beautiful plant, and this is great. It's called cat's mint. It's not considered um, like catnip. It's mm-hmm. not going to make your cat. It's not going to make your cats high. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, it's 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 a close relative. But it's great for like repelling aphids from your your plants. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, aphids cannot stand it, and the bees love it. And it's very it has beautiful flowers, and it it doesn't get as tall as catnip does. So it's like a a nice bush, like a ground cover. We did our raised beds with cinder block. And uh, with the cinder blocks turned up and then we put dirt in all of the holes of the cinder block as well. So a lot of times I'll plant like my flowers and my herbs in those holes around the plants of the garden, right? That's a pretty cool little idea. And like for the mint, it keeps it all contained, you know, so it's not just out of controlness. Um, Yeah, because any anybody that's uh, planted mint, mint or any mint plant knows that it will vigorously take over everything. everything. <laughs> yes. Be everywhere. And then but you'll be mowing your lawn and it's minty. It's yummy. Snow. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh-huh. Hey, but minty you, fresh. Just your breath. <laughs> <laughs> but the nice thing is like mint will repel ants. So that's a beautiful thing. So not a bad thing to have around your house. And not about thing. fire. For somebody <laughs> like me who doesn't like bitter Like, I can drink the herbal teas with mint because I like the mint flavor. So um, it covers up a lot of those. Like, if you're, you know, during doing herbal teas for a cold or something like that, the mint really helps, like, cover up the bitterness of flavors of teas like that. Absolutely. And you could throw in, like, some lemon balm in there as well and you get that nice lemon Mm -hmm. flavor. Yep, with the honey. Yum. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that brings us into our next one. Um, so herbs, specific herbs. You you brought a lot of herbs with your three flowers, though. So do you got like list of other herbs that you like to plant around there? Oh, um, holy basil. I love holy basil. Holy um, it's also basil. Holy basil. Um, it's it's another great. It's another great uh, herb for pollinating ignore so and then if you don't want it around your house put it in the bag um but it is fantastic it has a similar flavor to like any of our other basils that we we have available like purple basil or um italian basil the genovese basil uh, but it this one has a really nice um it makes a really great tea Okay. So it and it helps relieve stress and anxiety. And it will knock you out. It's kind of like if you were to have like a lavender tea before bed or a chamomile tea before mm-hmm. bed. It will it kind of just tires you out and mellows you down. All right. Holy tea for Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Easter Sunday. Perfect. And it uh, reminded me of um Holy Basil Batman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you have regular uh, basil? No, we have holy basil. Holy basil, for sure. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I've never heard of that one, so that's a new one on me. Yeah, holy basil. Um, I've recently got introduced to that last year, and uh, one of our members from the group that I'm a part of, um, they brought it a bunch of it dried, and it was just so fantastic. Hmm. So it had to be added to the garden. Um, <laughs> uh, see here, what other spice, like spice or herbs? Cause there's so many of them. I have so much mint. Uh-huh. Like I am a huge mint fan. Oh, uh, the so, chocolate. There's like a chocolate peppermint one and it actually tastes like chocolate. It's insane. Um, yes. It's good. Yes. I mean, I, we have so many flavors. We have like a pineapple mint, <laughs> a strawberry mint, ch- the chocolate mint. Right. Uh, we have. But, like, how awesome would that be, doomsday? There's no chance in hell you're getting chocolate. So, like, at least you could have, like, some chocolate mint and, and go from there. Yes. Like, they'll be your your thin mint uh, yeah. pick, you know? <laughs> Girl Scout cookies. Post-apocalyptic yes. Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> exactly. Oh, 
Those uh, little dealers. <laughs> <laughs> Always pushing boxes. Um, <laughs> I, I, feel do- so, I feel so guilty go- like seeing them because I'm like, oh, I already bought like 20 boxes already. <laughs> I can't buy another box. I'm so sorry. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like a different troop every time. With their little eyes. <laughs> you know you want the cookies. I'm like, like oh, you know. I do want the cookies. Dang it. <laughs> but they don't make you thin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I always do dill as a staple just because I do pickles. So. Oh, dill is fantastic. If you can that- figure out a way for the dill to come in at the same time as the cucumbers do that would be awesome yeah (laughs) the dill comes in like first thing in the year and then the cucumbers come in way later and you're like how do i get them together so yes um one thing like when we're i do a lot of heavy pruning and a lot of people probably cringe when i how i cut my plants but I kind of like stump them from going to seed. Mm-hmm. Right. And so constantly cutting them and trimming them and trying to make them like bush out more so that there's a higher yield per plant. That's a good idea. It, it helps a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially if you're like, I, I'll grow dill hydroponically indoors during the winter and it's, it dill can get pretty tall. So if you yep. want to train it, you can like train it to be a short, stout bush versus huh. like a massive tree <laughs> yes that's a great idea yeah um let's see and other really good herbs. there's so many herbs it's like kind of hard to pinpoint yeah no. red clover <laughs> is one that I, we had like like weeds in california and i really wish i had like a red clover patch down here really good for women uh for hormonal hormonal balance there you go, Chin. You got the women's hormonal balance. Just taking going notes. On. Taking notes. <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh, I gotta get some of that for. They keep peace in the household. <laughs> yeah. I guess I could throw chocolate, in mint, and red clover, right? Yep. Yes, and you're gonna have a happy lady for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I could add uh, nettle as an herb. Fair enough. Yeah, nettle. Uh, and it's also a great deterrent for people because they don't mm-hmm. like to walk through it. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. uh, and if you ever, and, and another pro tip, if you ever get a stinging nettle, if you have sword ferns around, the spores on the back of the fern will actually neutralize the stinging nettle. Huh. What is that? Sword is fern? It? Sword ferns. Huh. Isn't that a lot of the time in nature? There's like the, the ouchy plant and then the, the, uh, the plant that helps soothe it are yes, close yes. our neighbors in the woods or wherever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they generally, they generally are. Yeah. Like poison oak <laughs> and the, um, 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 the silver leaf. It's called different stuff all over the place though. Um, but it actually helps out with poison oak and you can make it into a soap or whatnot. It grows. It usually contains the poison oak growing mm-hmm. around it. Begins with an M, silver leaf, mm, but I cannot pull it off the top of my head right now. Yeah, and the nettles, they taste, they make great pesto. Really? And, oh, it's it's amazing. And it packs more nutrition than spinach. Yes. So a lot of people don't know that. It actually has a protein content to it, which like is yep. super rare for a full-grown plant. And it will make a fantastic fertilizer as well. So... Interesting. There's multiple purposes there. The stings are beneficial for arthritis. Oh, I didn't know that. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. I've done quite a bit of studying on nettle because we had a crumb load of them in California. Mm. I had to find some kind of why would they grow, right? What's their purpose? And they're actually really, really like you can live off a of stinging nettle for days. That's yeah. Yeah. It's that way here, but in the Pacific Northwest as well. Uh, we generally find it closer to like the water, mm-hmm. uh, but it's it's a, it's definitely a weed here. Yeah. But it looks beautiful when it comes up. Um, so yeah, um, milkweed thistle is another one we had a ton of in California, um, and it's pretty once it grows out. Um, it's actually a wild artichoke, um, and you can eat it. 
But man, it's a pain in the butt to weed eat down with a weed eater when you got to do a fire break for your house. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I burned out many a weed eater head on those plants. I'm like, oh, sorry, babe. My, my weed eater just burned out. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like our um, scotch broom. Yeah. <laughs> Up here. Yep. Just doesn't go away. <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, they bring in masticators to get rid of that stuff, and it still won't go away. Um, nothing better than in the summer when you hear all the little seeds popping in the field, and you just know that stuff is just going to be growing everywhere. Yeah. I actually made it into a grid, though. I would cut it down with my pruners and make it into a grid so we could play airsoft in it. That's fantastic. Yeah. It made a really cool play field. So. Oh, wow. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we did the red clover. That's my. And then, of course, I'm a Midwest girl. I want my parsley. Like the debates on between parsley and cilantro, but I'm parsley all the way. I don't like cilantro. So. Uh -uh. But... Well, the nice thing about parsley, too, is it doesn't get as. Uh... Like when it goes to flour, it's still somewhat edible in flavor, mm -hmm. whereas cilantro kind of takes on a soapy flavor. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yes. that plan is just ugh, ugh. But the bees love it. <laughs> true, true, yeah. And anything we can do for the bees, because like, um, even with the cucumbers, when I, so cucumbers are important to me because I do a lot of pickles. I've actually like sold pickles like crazy. I was going to actually have a pickle business at one time and, uh, my pickles have made it all the way down to Brazil for a wedding down there. Like one of my clients was like, I'm taking your pickles as a wedding gift. And I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. Like, but, um, if you don't have the pollinators near your cucumber plants, they are not going to produce as much and it'll be very, very dismal. So you've got to bring those pollinators into them. Luckily, the cucumbers have the pretty yellow flowers that they like a whole bunch. But it's never a bad thing to have, uh, you know, a wide array of um, availability for them to have good flowers to come into. Uh, yeah, a another great food producer that brings in bees is... Uh scarlet runners they are beautiful beans they're they're huh. they're pretty big they're a little smaller than a fava bean but they have uh but they're beautiful they're like red and uh black oh yep yep and but their flowers are so fragrant and they're scarlet red they look beautiful on trellises so you can use those as like a your edible landscape. Yeah. A viney that goes up around your trellis for like the entry to your garden or something. Yes. And mm -hmm. they're vigorous, vigorous growers, like very vigorous. But, and, but the, the, the smell is just so intoxicating. That's awesome. It's kind of, I'm going to have to yeah. check that out. And then the bean is, you can use the bean too. You can use the bean and they're heavy producers. Wow. Yeah, I always I kind of shy away from like the pod plants now because I love peas. I absolutely love peas. I can just eat like peas and ham and I'm fine. Like that's it. And butter, right? I'll just yeah. eat that. And uh so we you know, we always grew peas and it was more for just like so we had something to munch while we were in the garden. And so one year we're like, we're going into pea production, you know. We're going to harvest so many peas. It's not even funny. And we had like a whole garbage bag full of peas and it equaled one pint when it was yeah. damp. I was like, yeah. oh, I was so deflated. I'm like, we're never planting peas again, ever. <laughs> you know? That, that's how I felt when I uh, planted garbanzos. Uh huh. And oh. I was like, there's only two pods. Or two beans per pod? What? What is this garbage? <laughs> right? How many do I have to break open to actually, like, get? No. This is crazy. <laughs> the other thing that I um eat like a crazy woman is chia. um Because it's a viscous fat burner. It's got fiber. It's great for my stomach. Um, it does wonderful things for me. I've, I've struggled with the IBS. Because I had way too many antibiotics when I was a kid. And um, 
So what, next time I get chia, I'm going to just buy two bags of it and then do a spread on a section of a yard and just see if I can just get like a chia field to come up and see what that, <laughs> what it even looks like, you know. Uh, I think, I think you have the climate for them to actually thrive. So yep. that's perfect. Yeah. And I was like, I mean, if my husband mows it, I mean, I want some to go to seed, but if he mows it, I mean, you paint it on stuff and it looks like beautiful grass. So what would be the problem, you know? So I yeah. got the husband on board with his yard, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we we lived on 40 acres in the foothills. If you want a flat spot, you got to make it. We worked on that property, sun up, sun down, whenever we weren't working on work. And so when we moved, he was like, I want to be able to do all the yard work in one day. And now he's got his lawn and everything. And so he's just very protective of his lawn. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh-huh. I know. I'm fighting him for space. See, I got the gardens going and like we had an area that doesn't grow well. So I was like, okay, we'll bring in dirt and we'll make our gardens there. He's like, oh, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So, yeah. Yeah. See, for the life of us, we can't get grass to grow it because the moss takes over. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. So it's like the lawn looks luscious and green, but it's all moss. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whereas ours is like there's these grass burr things. And so you're like, oh, it's so nice. <laughs> oh, no, it's not oh. nice. I can't go out there with bare feet. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Those down here. Dogs either. Yeah, they get them stuck in their feet, too. I just, they're good. They'll come up to me. Oh, oh, mom, mom. I'm like, okay, I got it. Um, But they also have different septic systems down here because of the sandy ground. So, like, your your stuff goes into the tank, and then it goes out. But instead of going to, out to leach fields, it goes out to a sprinkler system. And that's literally, like, what waters our front yard is the water from the septic system right <laughs> so we call it the poop water and i definitely wouldn't want to like eat things that is getting watered with that water so um that's so the front yard is all his because i can't grow anything out there anyway because the front's watered with the with the other i mean it provides water it does what it's supposed to do it's just weird yeah. <laughs> Don't want to be walked across the lawn to get the uh, mail when the sprinkler system goes off. Yeah, no. Yeah, when there's like a, uh, a you know, a breeze blowing. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. Luckily, they do most of their watering at night unless it's like laundry day and they have to like do a release in the afternoon. But yeah, everybody has those systems out here and it's, it's trippy. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like it. So, uh, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans. Yeah. <laughs> pee on your grass <laughs> right i don't know <laughs> so that's how they did it though all righty well we better jump into our changing earth news you gonna stick around for the changing earth news jasmine or are you gonna uh jump off uh, absolutely i'll stick around all right let's roll i'm gonna go ahead and play some of the changing earth weather music here we go Are you struggling with water storage woes? Tired of the algae and bacteria growing in your water? The weight of storing it and the amount of space that it takes up? The time that it takes to rotate it and even when it comes to drinking it, you still need a filter because it's gone stale and you're not sure what has been growing in there. This limited supply of water storage can be a mess to store. If any of the containers break, you have water all over the place, and this leaves you storing water in a place that might not be as concealed as you'd prefer. Today, I want to introduce you to the solution, which is the water full system. The water full system hooks up to any outdoor spigot. It contains 30 gallons of on-demand drinkable water for whenever disaster hits you and you need that water. Made in America to meet all safety requirements to ensure that you have drinkable water whenever you need it. 
there's no need to rotate the waterfall system because its pressurized canister ensures your water's rotated every time you turn the hose on. It can stand up to any type of weather, is very, very durable, and it's made with UV inhibitors so it can stand the test of time in the sun. You don't have to worry about cleaning your waterfall system because it takes care of itself. It is the ultimate plug and play water storage system, ensuring you have 30 gallons of drinkable water should disaster hit. Its sleek color ensures that it blends into any outdoor atmosphere and doesn't leave you with a big blue beacon of water storage outside of your home. There's no guesswork to put the waterfall system together. It is a plug and play system that you can have ready in about 10 minutes. As somebody who's been into preparedness and helping others to prepare for any disasters that befall their life, the waterfall system is the solution to water storage. I highly recommend you go over to Waterfall, check it out, and use the code SARA, S-A-R-A. One more time, go over to Waterfall, check it out, see about their system, and if it's a good fit for you, and use the code SARA, S-A-R-A, help the changing earth world go round and get yourself prepared for the next disaster. All right, change your north news, news, news. Uh oh, Jasmine's gonna be like, dude, I'm gonna handle your audio for you. This is just lame. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure class. I can do it with something that I have over there. I've got all this equipment. I just don't know, you know. Okay, so eyes on the sun this week. Um, we had four plasma filament eruptions come off of the sun. Luckily, none of them were earthbound. We would be very much aware if any of those were earthbound. They are some serious ejections when that happens, like the filament just sloughs off there. Different than when a CME is released. Um, it's just like a chunk of the sun that's like falling off. So we would definitely be aware if they were earthbound. Um, there are some that are um, still unstable that could be a threat. So that's why we have eyes on that. There's also a coronal hole. Um, and solar wind is suspected to uptick uh, this week. So that's going to um, bring an enhanced chance of earthquake activity. Um, there is a significant sunspot that's developing. Mainstream media is even talking about it. So that's a little odd and causes you to, yeah, to take note because um, there's a very big energetic sunspot that's uh we've detected it on the other side of the sun and it's rotating and it will be directly earth facing so we're gonna just keep eyes on that and uh, hope for the best they have some really interesting um graphics on how that potential micro solar nova would look from from the sun when it happens and so there's chances for like glancing blows and things like that as well. So all is not lost in like this 12,000 year cycle that we're in right now. I love watching the videos though about how everything is um, human cause. Oh, humans cause everything, you know. Well, you know, I'm sure we're not helping the situation, but um, yeah, th I think the planet knows what it's doing before we decided to grace it with our presence. Okay, March 31st, we're going back. We're going back in time a little bit. Uh, big pickup day, just because we had some big um, notable things that were worth talking about that I picked up from, you know, when we're in on Saturday, Sunday, it's hard for me to get information. So sometimes when I go back, there's viable things worth talking about. So on March 31st, there was 427 earthquakes <clears throat> that were 2.0 or bigger, the biggest of which was a 5.6 in the Indian Ocean. Brazil had another severe storm in Rio de Janeiro. Um, they received 45.8 millimeters or 1.8 inches of rain in 30 minutes. Okay, serious storm, massive amounts of flooding. Two people died that day in that storm. In central Iraq, they had the severe sandstorm that swept across the country. 500 people were hospitalized for respiratory problems because it, it was so bad in the sandstorm. 
It reduced visibility. Dust was everywhere. And last year in 2022, Iraq had over 100 sandstorms. It's an unprecedented amount of sandstorms to hit them. So very unusual. And they're definitely seeing an uptick in that activity. In Western Ecuador, they had one milli- they had one meter or 3.2 foot high floodwaters. So I'm only five foot nothing, 100 and nothing. Um, chin's like eight foot. And <laughs> so Chin could walk in that. I would have a hard time in three foot high floodwaters. Um, their rivers are overflowing. Literally, people's furniture in their homes is being swept out of the home. <laughs> yeah. Spring cleaning. Yeah, because the water is rushing like through the houses. You're now like part of the of the river, you know. So uh, it's a mess over there in Ecuador. I think garden girl in the chat has um an uncle there in ecuador so prayers hopefully everything's okay with him april 1st there was 424 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger biggest of which was a 5.1 in iran the usa had that was our storm that we had 73 tornadoes touch down i heard 100 touch down but 73 large official tornadoes touch down between Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Delaware, and Wisconsin. All in all, 26 people died. 126 people were injured. Massive destruction as far as homes and just damage. That was the day that Little Rock was hit by the EF3. 266 kilometer per hour or 165 mile per hour winds. Absolute insanity. Sometimes you don't even see the tropical cyclones get whipped up to wind speeds of that much. So um, that is kicking. The path that it ripped through was 32 to 40 kilometers or 20 to 25 miles long. Just absolutely devastating. By the end of the night, 766,000 people were without power. That is pretty extreme storm. It was... uh, one for the record books that is for sure and next time you wonder why your insurance prices are going up keep track of all these numbers folks (laughs) that's all i'm saying okay in eastern latvia the melting snow and rain has caused flooding as rivers rise eight roads are literally underwater so communication has been cut off to a lot of towns and cause the need for evacuation and the levels are supposed to just keep increasing as the rain events get worse and worse um they are on the border with belarus where all of this is happening and belarus also has 26 districts flooded so um lots of rain over there lots of rain everywhere where it got hit it got hit on April 2nd, there was 451 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was a 7.0 in Papua New Guinea. And Bima in eastern Indonesia, like southeastern Indonesia and those islands, they had flooding with a tornado. So they, again, down there, they're getting these weird tornadoes. And 41 hectares of rice was flooded or damaged along with multiple homes, bridges collapsed. Um, this is like five sub districts that were totally flooded out. But at the same time, then they get hit by a 5.5 earthquake right after that. That was 19 kilometers or 12 miles deep. So it was a shallow earthquake. Luckily, no one was injured. But I mean, here is like your full assault of uh, natural disasters for you. Okay, so this one's interesting. In the United States, can in Kansas there's um wildfires going and it's the butler county fires and it's really heavy smoke it's affecting traffic uh two people were critically injured in traffic incidents because of the smoke with six fires burning in the county um in the county along with structure loss and the firefighters were like man we keep knocking these things down but they just keep rekindling (laughs) so i watch a earthquake show called dutch sense I don't know if you guys know of Dutch Sense, but he does a lot of earthquake earthquake forecasting. 
and talking about some really interesting, um, you know, patterns with our earthquakes. And he noticed just the other night that all of these hot spots are just being created and then suddenly disappear and being created and suddenly disappear. And you can see it on the weather, um, on the GOES weather um, satellites, these little hot spots and then the smoke. And this is across three states. So it's Kansas, Missouri, and one other state. I can't remember what the other one was. Um, but sometimes this type of activity is indicative of a precursor for earthquake activity. So with the increased awareness that we have from the sun coming, and we've been having a lot of that sign, um, people on the new Madrid should definitely uh, be a little bit prepared, like make sure you're earthquake prepared, because you never know, better to be safe than sorry. In eastern Tunisia. There, um, this is a country that's just north of Libya on the Mediterranean. They had a huge sandstorm that came in, hit the coastline. A lot of these sandstorms going on in northeastern Dominican Republic or Dominican Republic of Congo. They had a deadly landslide in Bulwa. This is a horrible story um, to be sharing on Easter. But um, at least 20 fatalities, It's the death counts expected to rise. There was 25 mothers with their children that were doing laundry on the stream when the mountainside collapsed. And um, they're trying their best to recover people out of there. But uh, it, it, it wasn't a good situation. And uh, they've been having a lot of rain for a lot of months. So prayers go out to all the families affected by that tragic incident. On April 3rd, there was 412 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was a 6.4 in the Indian Ocean in Indonesia. Eastern Russia on the Kamchatka Peninsula, they got hit with a 6.5 magnitude earthquake. The epicenter was um, 106 kilometers or 65 miles deep. This is the strongest earthquake they've had in the last 25 years. And they're like, well, some buildings cracked and, and some bottles fell off the shelves, but at least the volcanoes are erupting. So we'll see how that works out as we go on in the days. In southeastern Kenya, they had a heavy rainstorm with flash flooding, severe damage to the coastal countries. Um, another horrible story, a pregnant mother and her three children were swept away. 12 people died in total, and many, many people have been left homeless over there due to that flooding. Also, eastern South Africa got hit by a severe storm, massive property damage, infrastructure damage as far as them losing um, police stations and things like that. One person died in that event, and many more were injured. On April 4th, there was 471 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger biggest of which was a 6.3 in the North Pacific Ocean by Panama. South Central China, seven people died. 20 people were injured in a major avalanche in this place called Sikkim, S-I-K-K-A-M. It's on the India border. It's a major tourist attraction. They've had some really severe snowfalls there, and the people weren't supposed to travel that far. But they actually, the, the tourists were actually threatening the tour guides and things like that um, to get them to take them further. It's crazy, crazy. And um, they did. So they went further. Eventually, they went um, to where this avalanche happened. Now, after they cleared the snow, after the avalanche happened, they uncovered another 350 people along with 80 vehicles from the snow. So like... That's a lot of people that were going back there if it was supposed to be shut down. I don't know how good their barriers were or whatever, but um, <laughs> I'm just saying. Like Need some bigger signs. <laughs> yeah. And they're literally threatening like the tour guides and stuff. It's just a crazy story. Um, in the United States, 700 acres have burned in a wildfire in Owings, Balt in Baltimore County, Maryland. This is their largest fire event since 1970s in that state. Um, it was contained as of April 5th. In northwestern Chile, they had a 5.9 earthquake five miles offshore. It was 51 kilometers deep or 32 miles deep. 
Uh, buildings cracked. They had product loss because the shelves were shaking and everything, but no injuries out of that event, thank God. On April 5th, there was 466 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was a 5.1 in Acre, Brazil. In the United States, we had 12 more tornadoes touch down on April 5th, seven in Illinois causing um, property damage in Kelowna. Five people were killed in Bollinger County, Missouri. It destroyed several communities there. 87 structures damaged um, in total and 12 of them completely destroyed. They had hail damage as, as well in Davenport, Iowa. They have pictures of the hail coming in bigger than softball size. So that is, don't be standing out in that stuff. In northwestern Peru, uh, Piura, it's on the northwestern coastline, Piura. There was intense rains, 93 millimeters or 3.6 inches fell. In a very quick time period, it absolutely just collapsed the drainage system, um, flooded the whole area. Further south, because of this rain falling, they had mudslides, um, the, the flood that was just pure mud, so that's the worst kind. The mud actually pulled away a heavy machinery driver in his um, rig along with the vehicle. They did rescue him, but unfortunately, a nine-year-old boy drowned in that flooding. On April 6th, there was 439 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was a 5.3 in Indonesia. In northwestern Burundi, they've had multiple days of heavy rain. It has left 14 people dead, landslides um, just going crazy, rivers overflowing. And these 14 people died because the river overflowed and it flooded a gold mine that they were like all working in. 14 people died in it and... Uh, some more were injured in that event but yeah wrong place at the wrong time yeah they should have hunkered down in a wine cellar right <laughs> not the gold mine that's not the gold mine not right? a good idea right you can always float away on water jugs if you have to so i'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> so southeastern canada quebec and ontario they got hit with this massive ice storm the ice storm was so, the ice was so thick. It was 1.4 inches or 3.5 centimeters thick. So it just formed all over everything. Absolutely collapsing trees all over the place. Three people died. 2.5 million people were left without power because of this ice storm. So a little bit of insanity going up there. And then um, on the 6th, the rains continued in the Peoria region. The flooding there is just absolutely off the chart. You got to look at the pictures of it. Um, infrastructure damage and homes just being completely washed away and made un uninhabitable. In central Argentina, they also saw massive flooding, 100 millimeters or four inches of water in less than one hour in Santa Rosa. And their drainage systems couldn't keep up either. They collapsed in uh, massive flooding. On April 7th, there was 390 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was a 5.0 in or a 5.8 in the North Pacific Ocean near Russia. And then Russia had their big earthquake. They're like, oh, well, at least our volcano didn't erupt because they've got a bunch of them on the Kamchatka Peninsula. Well, Bezami did erupt on the 7th. It threw, it just takes a little time. You know, the earthquake happens. Then a few days later, your volcano is going to go. Um, ash 10 kilometers or 32,000 feet in the air. It was, uh, produced a py pyroclastic flow as well, but it received the highest aviation hazard alert. So it was definitely a no fly zone while that activity was happening. The Cypress camp trail wildfire in Florida has gotten to be considerable size. This is burning in Collier County. It is up to 7,600 acres or 3,075 hectares. It is 10% contained at this time. They don't know how it was started, but there are no associated evacuations with that. So it's burning in a wild, in a, a forested area. It's just a bummer that the whole forest is burning up, basically. In Oman, there was a huge dust storm. 
causes damage to vehicles, things like that. But then after the dust storm is done, the rains come in right on its tail and just floods everything right behind it. So oh, that was kind of an interesting. Oh, event. man. <laughs> right? Oh, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Omanis people. <laughs> on April 8th, <clears throat> there was 374 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was a 5.3 in the South Pacific Ocean in Fiji. In western Puerto Rico, they had a severe flooding event with landslides. There are um, towns that are cut off, families that are cut off. So I don't know if everybody's okay at this point because they can't communicate because the bridge collapses and things like that. So um, we'll just have to wait for that story to kind of unfold. Then on the, on the eastern side of Saudi Arabia, but centrally located on that close coastline, they had a really significant hailstorm. It hit Mecca. Um, and it's always interesting to see the hail, like when it accumulates that much, much, and it makes the desert look like just snow land. It's, it's always kind of cool to see. Um, Thai city in Saudi Arabia was also hit by a severe thunderstorm causing flooding and strong torrent torrents in the desert. So that brings us up pretty close. Today's volcano update. Uh, Mount Pele and Vesuvius are not erupting in unison right now. Um, Pele is still on the unrest chart. There are 25 volcanoes erupting, mostly in Indonesia. There's 22 showing minor activity. Those are mostly in the Pacific Ocean and the Ring of Fire, the island nations. And then there's 35 showing unrest. And we took one off the list in that unrest area. Everything else is the same. As far as earthquakes that are 4.0 or bigger, biggest earthquake in the last 24 hours is a 5.7 that happened in the Nicobar Islands. It's uh, in the India region. So 5.7 and a 5.5 hit there. There, <clears throat> There's been 37 4.0 or higher in the last 48 hours or last 24 hours, 70 in the last 48 257 in the last week and 527 in the last two weeks. Um, so for the last two days, our numbers are down a little bit, but last week and last two weeks, we're still riding up pretty high um, because of that solar activity. As far as wildfires in the United States, I'm sorry, I don't have worldwide numbers on the wildfires, but in the United States, we have 18 states reporting large wildfires. Um, eight of them are large ones, and they are consuming about 11,919 acres. Number one on the list, Chin, is still North Carolina with two fires burning and 5,405 acres. So I don't know well, what they're I'm doing. I'm glad to be uh, doing my part to keep the numbers up for you, sir. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's got to be over um, on the coast still. Um, over there where they had them burn him. Um, Oklahoma? It, it was like raining all week in here. So. Right? How can it still oh, be burning? It's burning. Really weird. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, and that's what I was talking about with those hot spots. Um, that, you know, if it is heat coming up from underneath, then it doesn't really matter what's going on on top. So that's always interesting um, to look at. And then uh, number two on the list is Oklahoma with three fires burning, 3,358 acres. And number three on the list is Florida, two fires burning, 2,701 acres. So that's the discrepancy in the numbers between um, what they were reporting from news and what they're reporting on the actual, um, um, the national uh where do I get this from? I don't know the exact name of it, but I can find it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're usually pretty good because um, I watch the California numbers from Cal Fire in real time and then compare it. The National Fire News, National Interagency Fire Center. So there you go. Now you can go find it too. But yeah. Just wait every Sunday and listen to it. Lots of rain. Lots of rain. 
You're getting the storm that hit me last Sunday, or you got that during the week. Yeah, we, we had it, like, mm. a little bit Thursday, then Friday and Saturday. Yeah. All righty. Well, happy Easter, everybody. And, um, yeah, Jasmine, thanks for coming on. That was, it was a lot of fun to have you on the show. Appreciate that. Thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, it's always good to have that, the you know, the input, the you pick each other's brains. I love that stuff. Love to learn. So come on, come on on and teach me anytime. Love it. Absolutely. And you <laughs> dropped the yarrow. So that's always Sarah's favorite. Yes. I mean, yarrow love good right one. there. It's a, it is a good <laughs> one. It grows well everywhere. Um, uh. Next week, we're starting Virgis. So. Hang on to your hats, guys. Here we go. And uh, we're going to be making serious audio drama um, progress. So I'm going to keep Jasmine busy over there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, guys. Happy Easter. Thank you all for listening. I hope you're having a wonderful time with your families and a great day. And until next time, remember, dream. Survive. Thrive. Thank you for joining Sarah and Chen for this episode of the Changing Earth Podcast. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Day After Disaster, Without Land, The Walls of Freedom, Battle for the South, Dark Days in Denver, and The Endless Night at www.authorsarahfhathaway.com. If you love the Changing Earth series and podcast, Become a supporter while you're there.